my grandparents took me to church, and then the church kind of fell apart, and I was like a free teen. And after that, I never really went back to church until I became an adult. Like, nobody else took me to church then. I always knew that, you know, God was real, and he sent his son to die on the cross for us, but I didn't have relationship. So I met my kid's dad, and we were in a relationship for over six years. And he started visiting a church that he grew up in as a child. So I started going with him to that church. And that's how, you know, I came about learning and growing in, like, the foundational things of Christ and developing a church family and different things like that. And once I started learning about just different things, I started to develop a zeal. And once I had that zeal, then I was so excited that I wanted to tell everybody about it, you know. So um, for a long time, and even still now, my desire is always for just everyone to know what they have access to in the kingdom. You know, that's the biggest thing for me. I don't like to see people hurting. I don't like to see people unnecessarily going through things because they're just unaware. So I believe that if we are just big on evangelizing and letting people know the truth, the good news, like what they have access to, who they are in Christ, you know, what they don't have to deal with, then they can be exposed to a whole new realm of glory in their lives. So evangelism is very, very, very important. And um, I just wanted to share that myself as like a little bit of my personal experience of coming into Christ and learning different things and how I was evangelized too and um, how I just now have a zeal and that zeal because of me knowing the power behind who God is and like I said, what we have access to and not wanting any of my brothers and sisters to not get the fullness of what they deserve when it comes to that. You know, like, that just pushes me. Like, I just want people to know. It's kind of just like you don't want to watch somebody suffer when they don't have to suffer. It's like, you know, they have pain medicine sitting on the table, but they don't know, so they just continue to be in pain. You know, but what if that pain medicine was the Bible? What if that pain medicine was the Word of God? You know, and if we encouraged them or gave them perspective or insight, on the way that God, you know, spoke to us or moved through us or introduced himself to us in a relational way, then they can have something to relate to, and it'll make it easier for them to grow in the things of God. Yeah, I believe so. So, well, um, someone just asked, is what I just said considered evangelizing? So... Evangelizing is a part of ministry, you know? So say you bump into somebody on the street, right? And, you you know, they are crying on the side of the road. And you're just like, you know, what's wrong? And she's just like, well, um, nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me, you know? And then you start telling them the truth. Well, I don't know what you've experienced, but I know that God loves you, and I know that you are a daughter, and I know that you are a royal priesthood, and that you are chosen, and God has great plans and great destinies for your life, and where you are right now is not where you're going to be, you know? And it might get hard, but there's so much more for you because God is for you than you can see right now, you know? And, I mean, it'll become ministry because, You're getting into that place of encouraging and lifting this person up from that place. And even if this is the first time that they're even hearing about Jesus, now they are um, open to want to know, like, what what does this mean? You know, like, what is all of what she's saying? Like, if they've never been exposed to the truth, you know, if they've never been exposed to what they have access to in the kingdom, then for them, if that was their first time hearing about it, me evangelizing to them, they would receive so much more than Jesus, but they would receive Jesus and all that he has to offer, you know, because they were open because of that vulnerable place that they were in. And it wasn't just say, hey, you should believe in God. You should believe in Jesus, but why and who you are? And that opens the door for relationship, which will stick much more than just telling people that they should go to church and they should believe in Jesus.
So I'll let you share, Monty. Now, I was just wondering that uh, if you came upon somebody, same situation, and they uh, said, I've been through all that, and God did nothing for me, and I grew up in church, and people, and God this, and Jesus that, and my life is a mess, and my husband beat me, and where was God then? Well, I mean, then how do you approach that situation that once they say, I've already been what you're telling me, and it didn't work for me? Situations like that are always tough. It's always rough, and it's difficult, you know, as that person who wants them to know the truth to really get in because they have these walls up because of their belief. You know, you're believing in something, even if you're not believing in God. So at this point, they have all of these walls up. They're in defense mode, and it's like, you know, you have to prove to them. But it's kind of like, I don't I don't know if you were at the leadership last night, but a lot of what we talked about would be so relevant in a situation like this, you know, where it is like maybe someone who was deep into the things of God and because of the issues of life, they became overwhelmed and they kind of just like slipped away and felt like, you know, God wasn't for them or whatever the case may be and got discouraged. All we can do is be love. Um, I remember Dan Mola gave a testimony one time about um, – a friend of his who he had, and the friend had started getting into some stuff that he wasn't supposed to be getting into. So he was friends with his friend, and he had became friends with the friend's wife. So they were in conversation, and the wife was telling Dan about some of the stuff that the husband was doing. So the husband was upset that Dan was agreeing with the wife. So he stopped talking to Dan. He wouldn't talk to him at all. He left his wife. And he left her for about three years, and he was with another woman, a younger woman. And one day, he was laying in the bed, and he woke up, and an angel was over top of his bed, and it knocked him out of the bed. And the first person that he called was Dan. So sometimes, you know, like, people just need a little bit of time. You know, when it's, things are so close, sometimes your vision is blurry. Or when it's so loud, you can't hear clearly because it's happening right then and there. So sometimes you just got to be loved and just trust that God is always faithful to complete whatever he starts. You know, I mean, and it's not always going to be us who, you know, sees the manifestation of what God has promised for some of his sons and daughters. But, you know, our job and our goal is always to be loved, to be support. If they don't want to hear it, you still say, you know, well, I understand that you feel that way, but I want you to know that I love you and that God loves you. And if you ever want to talk, if you ever need anything, I'm always here for you. You know, never close the door. Don't become offended because of the place that they're in. You know, you just still continue to be loved and still continue to be there for them so that they can know that when they do come to that place of, you know, revelation, when they're enlightened, when their eyes are open and they can finally hear, then they say, you know what, she was right. And then they'll call you. And, you know, that door will be open for you to then minister, and they'll be ready to receive all that God wants to give them in that moment. So, you know, don't be dismayed. You know, don't grow weary when people get like that. I mean, sometimes it's just difficult concerning different situations, you know. But you just continue to be loved because that's what Jesus would do. Anna? I was just going to say um, that sometimes when you're in those situations, you know, you have to, Every I, I actually was hearing 100% of what you were hearing is that love, love is the single most powerful weapon on this planet. You know, we have nuclear arms, we have bullets, we have all that stuff, but love is the most powerful weapon we have on this planet, and love is the only way that you can combat everything that the enemy has done, and you know, we know having been saved by God, and we know that being daughters of the king and that everything that the enemy has, has done in our lives, that God has a purpose and a plan for it. And I know that we've all, we all have stories and that we've all been through things. And so we can all look at other women that have been through similar things or 
different stories, you know, my life is not exactly like Cherise, but I have a ton of compassion for where Cherie's at in life and the things that Cherie's gone through because I know my story and I know where God's brought me through. So sometimes it's best if Cherie comes to me and Cherie's not saved, but Cherie or Cherie was saved and Cherie's like, I just meet Cherie on the street and she's like, yeah, but I was saved and I was in this church and, 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 um, he's probably paying attention, but, uh, you know, that other church, they put me and my kids out and they were not supportive of me and, and this and that and this and that. And, and I just don't think that God wants anything to do with me and he's not going to help me. And, and I never had anything. And so therefore I'm just going to go do me because I can't deal with it, you know? And then I'm left standing there and you're like, well, what do I really say, God? You know, so that's when the compassion part of you has to take over and just be like, you know, I watch Pastor Tracy do it over and over and over again, and it, it's just, you just have to stop and hear the Holy Spirit and hear what the Holy Spirit wants to say to somebody in that moment of, you know, I understand, and I'm sorry that that happened, and I don't think that that was, that Jesus was in the hurting of you. You know, I don't think that, that, that that's what Jesus would have wanted to happen, and I do believe that Jesus died for your sins, and I know that there's a part of you that still knows that. You know, and you have to, to really break that down. But the other thing I heard was, you mentioned Dan Muller, but had he not gone to that place with Todd White, you know, and been that seed and gone that distance with Todd White and, and really just continued to gone, to gone to that place with Todd White, even after Todd White went to Teen Challenge and came back and went back to that place, you know, and was like, oh, this isn't working, and I went back and, and everything else, he still continued, was like, I'm loved. You know, God is love. God is love. We still have to stand firm and be loved. Like, there's just no other weapon that will ever break through someone's shell. That was good. And sometimes, um, just, you know, piggybacking off of what Anna says, people will misrepresent love, you know? And they don't, they don't mean it. A lot of times people don't know any better, you know, and you just be loved in those moments too. So what would you say are some evangelism don'ts? Hold up. If you don't stop dot, 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 you're going straight to hell. Never tell anybody that. The entire Christian world has been telling them that their whole life. They already, quote, unquote, know they're going to hell. They don't want to hear it anymore. Any more don'ts for evangelism? Things you don't do. Okay, you want to say it again? You shouldn't be negative. You have to have a positive heart and, and speak in a positive fashion so that they can learn and um, grow in that. Very, very, very true. I think you must be honest, even if honest is, you know, depending on to what depth you're speaking with somebody. You know, you don't want to sugarcoat their situation and go, oh, everything's going to be just fine. And, and, you know, I think you need to be real as much as you can with love, kindness, and respect. Um, but um, I think the honest thing, because people have been told so many things through all kinds of church, belief, religion, God, Jesus, and, and, and whatever, and it becomes overwhelming. But if you are trying to reach them with what you know in your heart and the goodness and the love, then you you have to come off real and, and honest, I, I would think. Okay. I just wanted to um, agree with that but add to it that you still have to have discernment, though, and you have to know where, how much authority you have with that person. Because if they throw up a wall instantly, 
you're not going to be able to break through it with throwing some honesty at them because they're just going to shove you off. And, you know, a lot of times, even if it is true, people will get offended. And one thing about love, especially concerning evangelism, is it's never forced. You know, like, I don't feel like Jesus ever forced anybody to follow me. He had such influence. I mean, he would say, you know, just follow me. And you're like, oh, you know, sell everything, and leave everything, and just follow him because of who he was. I mean, and with us representing Christ in the earth today, you know, like with that same power, that same authority, you know, it should be the same way. Um, in the way that we walk, in the way that we act, you know, where we have that influence, and that makes evangelism natural. Oh, sorry. Being honest about ourselves and and what we've been through, perhaps, or um, and or and what God has done, because I can stand there and, and claim all kinds of miracles just to help her get on board, and none of them be true, you know. That's very true, because we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And um, because we don't become lovers unto ourselves. And that's so awesome because why do you believe that the testimony is so powerful? Because it breaks down the walls. It creates more room for relation. And when people are in relationship, it makes it easy to receive. People can be vulnerable. They can open up. They can share. They can hear. You know, whereas if I don't know you and I just met you and I see that you're out there and you're on drugs, I'm just like, oh, you need to get yourself together and you need to come to Jesus. Stop doing drugs in the name of Jesus. Da, 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 da. You know, I mean, like, first of all, you're offended because, yeah, I know I'm doing drugs. You know I'm doing drugs. It don't mean that I want to hear it from you. You know what I mean? And then I don't feel love. I don't feel grace. I don't feel compassion. And all of those things are so important. They're important to God. You know, even if you are looking at this person and you see the state that they're in, they're on drugs or whatever the case may be, when God looks at them, he sees his son. He sees his daughter. He sees his great creation. He, he sees his purpose for their life. He sees their calling, even in that very present state, you know? So for us, because sometimes we have sickly vision, you know, and we see the natural way and, you know, instead of from chair number one, like Leif used to say, um, with the perspective of heaven, the eyes of God, seeing the son or the daughter of the king, you know, I mean, like if you're a son or a daughter of the king, like you just you're just born into influence. You're born into royalty. You're born into dominion. You know, you just have it because of who you are and who your dad is, you know, and it, that's just the way that it is. So just like I said, with Jesus, he just had it. You know, he knew who he was. He walked confidently and he was about his work in his father's business. And when he said, follow me, people followed him. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, like con con condemning. It wasn't anything, you know what I mean? I mean, even with the woman at the well, she could have been condemned. But he, Jesus definitely used some discernment. <laughs> like, you know, you had a whole bunch of husbands, and the one you with now ain't your husband either, girl. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, the man who had many belongings, lots of money, and said, you want me to give it all? I have to give it all to follow you? Yeah, but, dang, I really like, you know, my Mercedes. I don't, I, I, can I keep that? And, um, but God didn't say, or Jesus didn't tell him, well, if you choose to keep that, then just forget you. I mean, it wasn't, I don't feel it's ever like that. There was um, a video that Colleen's daughter posted of a young lady in Baltimore, and it was in reference to the drugs, what is going on in the street. It was the most disturbing thing I think I've ever seen, and this girl was completely 
out of her mind. She was filthy, and she looked possessed and was all over the place. And, but whoever was videoing her was acting like they were casting out demons, and they were laughing and cussing. It was not a positive thing. And it went on for five. I finally had to shut it off and hold my phone and pray for this young lady because that was the most disturbing. And, and with you talking, I'm thinking if I came upon a situation because – I can't even emphasize, it, it was so disturbing. It was so sad, because this was a girl in her 20s, and she was out of it and doing crazy things. They were talking horrible to her. And, and, and Rochelle and I discussed a lot about righteousness today. And that we are made, you know, for God, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I thought, man, this is one of his daughters being wrangled in the street in Baltimore. Makes me want to go <laughs> and find, you know, these, not her specifically, but people. And, and just like you said, and tell them. You don't have to do anything except you are royal to him, you know. And um, I know I went off subject a little bit, but remember, there's so many, it's like there's so much even further than we can imagine people who are this close to suicide, killing their wife, or just, I mean, you know, the despair because I've been there, and, man, I, I, you know, if somebody would have had explained to me um, about God and Jesus the way I have learned in the last year here, my life would have been so different so long ago, you know. And But I know God's purpose came the way that it was intended, and so I'm thankful now, you know, because my life is just now starting. I'll be 56 in two weeks. How old am I? So. <laughs> When's your birthday? I'm the 26. Yep. So um, thank you so much for sharing me. Like, I just, you know, I felt that in my heart. Um, I don't like stuff like that either. And it's a song that I used to sing all the time, and I used to get so overwhelmed that I could never make it through the song. <laughs> God has graced me now where I, you know, I can kind of get through a song, but I don't know if you guys know what a friend we have in Jesus. It's a hymn, and I would just sing it, but it's this one part, and it's like, oh, what peace we often forfeit, and oh, what needless pains we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And like just thinking about the torment, needless, you don't have to be tormented, you know? I mean, but if you're not, if you don't know, if you don't know the good news, if nobody's sharing the gospel, if nobody is out there to expose the truth in a place full of darkness, you know, then these people become susceptible to the the wicked influence of the enemy, you know? So, I mean, it's very, very, very important. I do want to give a foundational scripture. I mean, thank you guys so much for sharing. <coughs> I'm just going to read this. Uh, I'll start here. What is evangelism? It can be an over attempt to teach others about Jesus Christ and salvation, but it can also be a lifestyle living our lives simply and in order to draw others to the light of God. So kind of like, you know, what I was saying about Jesus, he just lived his life and he drew people to the father, you know, like it was just a, a influence, just a drawing 
you know, because of who he was and the way that he lived his life. Um, Israel was established as a nation to be a blessing and a light to the nations around them and then draw people to God through their example. Likewise, we should also be salt and light to the world, drawing people to the Lord by our example. At the core of Christianity, it is faith and belief in the good news that is um, mentioned in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So as Christians, we should be proud and eager to share how the Lord has changed our lives. One way to explain the good news of the gospel of Christ is stated clearly by the Apostle Paul in Romans 10.9 as he writes, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I just want to touch on that a little bit because I think it's important for us to understand, especially when we're out witnessing or when we're out evangelizing, what that means. Okay, so I'll read it one more time. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So a lot of times we'll give the salvation prayer and, you know, like just have people repeat after you. I mean, and that's fine, but how do you know that they believe it in their heart? How can you convince anybody that somebody was raised from the dead? You know, the things that... Is beyond all understanding, and if you have a non-believer, they're gonna just really. And so, saying that prayer, you know, to me, that's more more than a one-time thing because I think it takes more, a little more Jesus, a little more Jesus, a little more, you know, as days go by, for you to actually ping on that and go. You know, he did do this. I feel that that's a possibility, at least. You know, because it's hard to wrap your head around some of a lot of the things, things that are unseen. I believe that we are here to be the vis- visible presence of uh, Jesus, and that's what we've called, been called to be. And so, what we do, how we walk, show people who Jesus is. That's why it's very important for what we do. Very, very, very true. And I mean, you know, like the question that I asked was, how do we know that people believed it in their heart when we do that, you know, um, salvation prayer, you know? But I believe, like you were saying, like in our walk, in our influence by, you know, the way that things are said, like I can say something like, I just won $1,000. And you wouldn't question it. You know, you would just be like, oh, you just won $1,000 because the influence behind it, the place that it's coming from, it just makes you want to believe it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have to prove it to you at first. I mean, like, later you might start asking questions. But initially, you know, you are you hear the excitement. Everything in me is agreeing with what I'm saying. So because of that, then you believe it. You know what I mean? So in the same way, like if I'm evangelizing and somebody doesn't know about Jesus and I'm just like, yeah, you should like believe in Jesus. He loves you. I mean, go to church. He died on the cross for you and me. Yep. So he loves you. Um, I mean, you should just know that. I mean, it's what's convincing about that? What's what does that make you want to believe in Jesus? You know, I mean, and it's not about works, you know. I mean, because if I'm just going out there to say like, yeah, you know, I got all of these people saved, and you know, they said the salvation prayer with me, but that was my approach. Like these people will probably never look for me, never look for any more of what I was speaking about. And God graces us with opportunities. Sometimes we see people once that we may never, ever, ever see again, you know, and God will place us in their paths for specific times and specific moments. Like, 
you know, you run across people and you never know what happened before you saw them. You never knew what was going on in that day. But at that moment, you have an opportunity to express the goodness of God, even if you don't mention him, but if you show it through your actions, you know, through your influence, you know, and they'll just be like, man, something's different about her. She's always happy, always smiling, always laughing. <laughs> Now, if everything that you're saying is a character, a characteristic of who you would see God to be, you know what I mean? Then maybe the signs are pointing to Holy Spirit. So I can share a testimony about, I shared it at Sons and Daughters, so I can share it again for some of you who may be familiar with it. But um, when I first started my job in Annapolis, it wasn't really going well for me. I mean... Because I'm so used to just being, hey, I'm here. And they were not trying to hear any of that. <laughs> it was like, I'm, it's nighttime. Everybody's trying to go to sleep. We just want quiet. Why are you so loud? You know? And um, <laughs> so it was difficult for me initially. I was just like, okay, I'll just go to work. I'll do my job. And I'll just go sit at the other end of the hallway. And I won't bother anybody. All my work is done. And I can just get my excitement when I go into my patient's room. Because when I go in there, I'm so happy to see them and take care of them. And they're so happy that I'm there. So I get to have it there. But then when I come out, it's just like this stronghold on the unit. It's heavy, you know, and it's just like, dreary and weary and I'm just like oh, I'm ready to go you know and I was actually even considering leaving leaving my job and just driving to my other job for 45 minutes I, every time I had to go just because I would rather be happy you know what I mean but Pastor David was preaching one time and he said if you want friends show yourself friendly so I said okay and I thought you know what God if you have placed me on this unit to bring this stronghold down or like, you know, for whatever you want to do, I say yes. You know, like I surrender what I may feel or how it may make me feel to manifest your kingdom, you know. And I went to work and it was two specific people that I would work with, never on the same days, but they've both been there for years. They're both set in their ways and they're like the people who talk about everything and everybody. So I will always just separate myself because I didn't want to be consumed with those conversations or even around them, you know. But as believers, like I was just talking about before, for having that realm of influence, you can control the atmosphere. You know what I mean? You don't have to just sit there and be subjected to it. You can shift it anytime you want. It's a gift. God gave it to us, influence. So um, this one particular day, one of the women who was giving me a really hard time, she um, she needed help. Well, before she needed help, I asked her, she was talking about something, and I was just like, hey, so what do you like to do? You know, like, what are you doing? What's going on with you? And she was just like, what? And, like, kind of taken away because she talks so much about everything and everybody else that, like, I guess nobody ever asked her that. So she was kind of shocked. And she was just like, well, my mother always told me, never let your right hand know what your left hand doing. And I was just like, okay. <laughs> and I just kept on going, you know, but it opened up a door of communication because before I just wouldn't say anything. I would just go do my work and da 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 and, like, have my fun when I go inside of my patient's room, come back into the hallway, and then it's just the same blah again. So um, <clears throat> that same day, that same night we were working, and she had a very heavy workload, whereas mine wasn't as heavy. So I was like, let me help you get some of this done, you know, so that you won't have to be here after it's time to go. And she's just like, no, I got it. Uh -uh, I'm good like that. And I'm just like, okay. So I'm sitting there documenting, and I see her, like, going here and there, still having all of these other things to do and still things that are coming up. And I was just like, listen, let me just help you. Uh-uh, no, I'm good. I got it. I don't need your help, whatever, all of this, because she really didn't want to 
be friendly with me because she had already talked bad about me and all of these other things. And so now it's just like she can't look like a hypocrite because she already made up in her mind that she wasn't going to be friendly with me. So, you know, coming against those people who are already against you, it's kind of difficult. But with the grace of God, he always, you know, like Anna said, like he always makes a way for love to conquer all. So um, I just ended up helping her anyway, even with her no. I started at the opposite end of the hallway, and I met her at the beginning. And um, once we were done, it was, like, right on time, time to go. And, like, she was like, thank you so much for helping. And I said, well, teamwork makes the dream work, you know, and just, like, completely ignoring anything that the enemy would try to do to cause division or bring his negative influence, you know, on her or whatever. But through that, she saw that I was for her even though she was against me or, you know, or she was feeling influenced to be against me because it's not flesh and blood that we fight against, you know. But um, after that, I was just, like, so intentional about investing into conversations with her and, like, just talking about And so, you know, like, and then she just started opening up and telling me different things that she likes to do. So she told me she likes um, to make, like, shea butter so she actually one day made some and she brought it to work and gave it to me. Like she let me pick two different fragrances. And it was just so amazing, you know what I mean? Because it showed how, you know, you're in a situation with this person who was completely against you. They don't want nothing to do with anything you. You're too happy. It's too late. You want to do things different. That's We want everything to be the same, you know, and when you're, coming into a place that's already preset sometimes it can be a little bit of friction you know and um but God has purpose for all of that you know but like I said I was able to develop a relationship with her and even like one of the last shifts that we work together every time I get an opportunity opportunity to a hugger I get a chance like I can hug her now like the same woman who pretty much despised me talked about me went to the boss about me and everything complaining about me now I can love on her and she can love on me and I can hug her and you know it's weird to everybody else because what I thought everybody else was saying too but because I was willing to just submit to God and yield to his plan in his place now there's such a grace on a unit and like even when she's there whenever I'm there it's always peace it's always light it's always joy you know and I'm just grateful but it could have been the other way, you know what I mean, where I was just like, well, nobody likes me, nobody's for me here, I'm out of here, or like, she don't say nothing to me, I don't say nothing to her, but if I take on the perspective of heaven, and I'm just like, this is a daughter of the king, but she must not know, you know, like, she must not be aware of who she is in Christ, and I have invited her to church, and I'm still working on it, and prayerfully, she will be coming soon, but I get to talk to her all the time. And it's a privilege. You know, it's a privilege. And like I said, I know that if even if people don't understand me, they know that something's different about me. And that difference is Holy Spirit. You know, where I can walk into a place and everything's crazy or everything's different, but I'm bright and I'm shiny and smiling with the glory of the Lord. You know, um, it's influence and it helps. So because... I'm already like that. Walls are already coming down. Like, people don't have to um, <clears throat> try to figure me out because I'm an open book. And, you know, I say the same thing. Like, you know, for you guys, like, whenever you feel an opportunity, just be open. Just be free and be yourself because through that, like, so many people are just going to want to tell you their whole life story. <laughs> they tell you their whole life story. And it's because, you know, God has graced you with that influence and you can pray concerning different things, you know, that they may or may not share. And um, they feel like they can trust you because you're just the glory of the Lord and you're a son and your daughter. So um, that was a testimony for me of how I overcame <laughs> a difficult situation, um, you know, involving evangelism, too. I mean, where I have told her about Jesus and um, I got to you know show what Jesus would do in a situation like that which was still be love um, even when you felt like everything was against you so does anybody else want to share a testimony of 
a similar or different experience that they had concerning something like that? Okay, Rochelle and I have not always been friends. <laughs> no, and and um, um. Well, I when I moved in the house, um, I'm a caregiver. I usually take care of everything, make sure everything's done, and therefore I wanted everything done a certain way. And um, I was rude <laughs> and uh, would say things. I never, I guess, uh, because Rochelle is very quiet, and uh, to herself that I never gave her a chance. But uh, we bumped heads, and I would always apologize because I knew I was always being wrong. And um, But then a few months ago, things changed for me. And um, she has um, been an example of of peace and how to handle a situation and um, not let things get you all wound up and um, I've watched her and and she now we we can laugh and we can talk and we share today um, sermons about uh, being the righteousness of God and. I believe that God has brought us together, which was probably the most unlikely pair of the house, <laughs> which was pretty much my fault. Um, and but um, she's always been very patient with me. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Really, yeah, no, sure. I'm really, I'm really, really honest. Like that's that's like not a surprise. Honestly, at all. But we, we have become and have overcome with God's grace, with um, revelation of who I am in, in um, the kingdom of God and um, how I should represent myself and the Lord and love his people, no matter, you know, who and... Um, it's not even specific things. It's just over time, things have just changed. And um, I think, and we're so thankful because we feel like some of your walls have come down. And that you trust us. Are, uh, they I very much the were. That that we have. Yeah. A lot of my old walls were up because of the challenges that we have. Yeah. Yeah, and it was. Yes. So, I thank God so much. I just thank you. What Anna had said at the very beginning about love being the strongest is most definitely the case because it's 
I definitely, definitely had a choice of, I had a choice. Like, what was that chosen, that thing? That I, I had a choice of either going the way of God and being loving, patient, letting him use me, humbling myself, or letting a lot of, a lot of bad emotions I could have let well up and let it that overtake me, but I let choose to let God rule. And because of that, because of that, God has been the one to get the honor, and the enemy has been crushed underfoot because there's so many times that he really, really could have won, and he's not. And I know that God is so pleased because he has used it, this opportunity and this situation for both of us to grow and for this, this, this testimony is going to be said many, many times, and it's because it's something, it's so funny. It is. We're the, a very unlikely yeah. pairing. We really are a ven- very unlikely pairing, and well, I, I just felt um, her about what you care about and what is important to you, and and to me that is the grounds of a, a true friendship. Even though we don't hang out, we don't, but uh, because we live in the same house, and you have carried yourself very Christ-like in some very rough <laughs> situations, and um, so you've been such a, a, a big example to me of I would like, because I think I've told you that, and I wish I had your peace, you know, on some days. But, um, yes, and I care very much about you. It's really weird, but I do. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Amen. So, um, that was beautiful. Like, I was, I mean, I really, um, like, I I really felt like I felt the Father's delight. And the reason why it may feel weird, because it's all God, you know, and a lot of times he will take unlikely things and make something so beautiful out of it because it's for his glory. You know, so I do want to just pray, just just pray over you guys and just bless you. So, God, I just thank you so much for them. And I thank you for this great work that you've started in their lives. I thank you, God, that they have completely submitted and surrendered all that they are to you. And I thank you, God, that they're open for all that you want to do in their lives, both individually and together as a dynamic duo, God. I thank you for the salt and the pepper rising up, God, for your glory. So we just say, have your way in their life, have your way in their relationship, God. And I just say that they will just do great things for the kingdom, that they will manifest the glory of God in the earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Like, I really felt like the delight of the Lord on that. Like, like I felt like, you know, like, I get emotional easily, but... <laughs> Yeah, but, like, I really felt like, you know, he's very pleased. He's so pleased, and he's so proud of you both. Yeah, so God bless you. Yeah. And that is, is um, for anybody who didn't hear her, she just said that the revelation of righteousness could not come without humility, you know, and um, that's pretty much what you said, right? Um, it's learning that, like, you should always prefer your brother or your sister before yourself. Like, love is sacrifice, you know? You don't have to always be right. You don't have to always be hurt. And even when I was sitting there and I was listening to you guys, you know, I could hear Jesus on the cross saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. You know, sometimes people are just ignorant. And they, but you didn't know. You know, and I'm just saying like, you know, and, you know, because we're talking about just evangelism and coming into this place of relationships and different things, like you just have to always take that position of Jesus on the cross where you're being sacrificed for somebody else and say, forgive them. For they know not what they do. They don't know. They don't realize. You know, they d- they don't know. And that's why I'm always at the foot of the cross. Like, God, oh, bring them into the revelation of your love. 
bring them into the revelation of your heart. You know, I mean, and through that vein, you know, in that place of love, like from that place of them, you know, when you pray, you're earnestly desiring for somebody to know the fullness of the love of God. You know, like that question that I asked, how do you know that they believe it in their heart? You know, like you can feel it. You know, you can feel it, and you want them to know the fullness, you know, even if it's not right in that moment, you know, because we don't always understand. But you pray, like, Father, whatever they do, whatever they don't do, forgive them, because they don't know. But they're trying. They're trying, and that's a great start to be open and try. So bless you, ladies. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for sharing your testimony. Whew, that was good. <coughs> Anna, come on up, honey. Come on up here. So, this is about to get really serious, Anna, because a lot of people need to hear your side of the story. Because I believe the way I feel, a lot of people have felt. So, I think this will be good. Inner healing part two. Well, you know, when I when I was able to speak that one night, um, I was able to really share a lot about, you know, who I am, and uh, I am a severely misunderstood individual. Uh, oh, it's very easy to explain this. Um, in my brain, there is a constant flood of about 50 things that I am thinking about that need to be done, and it never stops. And unfortunately, I have an apostolic, um, a high apostolic and a somewhat lower down the line pastoral calling on my life and a prophetic calling. So what happens when you collide these three callings on your life in the spiritual is amazing and it's very deep and it's very beautiful and, and amazing things can happen because when you collide all that with love there's truth and people are set free and deliverance happens and God really is able to use my life and and um you know wonderful things can happen when I am not fully immersed in the Holy Spirit and walking in love bad things come out of my mouth and but it's only because I'm like literally busy or I'm thinking about something and then somebody wants to talk to me or and something happens, and I'm like, are you serious right now? And literally, somehow that comes across in my body language or my facial expressions or my attitude, and I'm like, I, we don't need to be talking. Or I'm frustrated with my mom, not the pastor, which is what a lot of people see and get angry with me about because I'm frustrated with my mom, not the pastor, because in that moment, I'm like, please just stop annoying me, mother, which we've all been there. And it's my brain stops functioning as, hey, you're my pastor, and there's 20 people around. I'm like, yeah, you're my mom, and you're getting on my nerves, and this is how I want to act, because I have a whole deeper inner healing reason for all those that we just simply will not go to on a recorded camera right now. I don't even know where you're getting ready to go with this. Yeah, but I was crying. I literally, Cherie, I was playing a joke just now. Well, okay. Well, Anna was playing, and she made a joke, and she said that when, I mean, but you know it's truth in every joke, right? They try to laugh about it to kind of make light of it, but really there's something in there. So I want to get to the something that's hidden in the joke. So when I first met Anna, I could not understand her. Nope, couldn't understand her. I'm just like, why is she always mad? <laughs> she is always angry. And I'm just like, I want to speak to her, but I don't really know if that's going to make her even more mad. <laughs> but that's the way I'm. I'm talking about... That's the way, and that's what I'm talking about. 
it you know what it was that night I talked about? It's the the resting face. I do have resting face. I do, and people always think that I'm mad because I'm a highly focused individual, and I do not get out of highly focused. So I was like, why is she always so mad? She can call it highly focused. I can say angry because I don't know her. And anybody else coming in who doesn't know her is going to perceive the same thing. They're not going to perceive like, oh, she's so influential with the love of God. So I want to follow her. You're the best evangelist in the whole house. Leave yeah. Me in the booth where I belong. No, I'm just saying we all have to rise up. And Anna wanted to talk about it, so now we're going to talk about it, right? So that was how I felt initially. But I want to talk about how God um, kind of brought us together for me, from, from my perspective. So for a long time, Still just couldn't get it. Like, why is she so mad? Why is she so angry? And then, like, I would hear, you know, I heard her give a testimony about, like, a surgery that she had and just, uh, you know, a couple of things. And I'm like, oh, like, man, like, you know, she's been through a lot, you know? Like, I know I've been through a lot, but she's really been through a lot. And, I mean, I can't say how I would feel if I had to endure half of the stuff that she had to endure. So because of me, you know, putting myself in a place of realizing all that she had been through, my heart kind of like softened and I started to gain compassion where I'm just like, before I'm just like, she don't need to be doing nothing in church. She need to be sitting in the first row, receiving all the Holy Spirit has for her. Get a Lord. She needs it more than anybody else probably do up in here. But um, thank God for Jesus. And, you know, that statement, I forgive the Lord, for she knows not what she does. <laughs> yeah, but seriously, yeah, I mean, we do. But, you know, once I started to really consider all that she had endured, you know, and I just said, you know, people can always say, you know, how they think it should be or what they would do if they were in a situation. But you never really know until you're in that situation. And Anna has endured. I mean, it didn't make her always being angry, right? But sometimes that's how people process things. Or she doesn't call it being angry. She calls it being highly focused. I call it being angry. So so last night, Pastor Tracy so casually threw me under a bus without mentioning my name. She did. She was talking about these women that she was um, had been talking to. She was talking about me. No, no, it's okay. I told her, she said, I was speaking truth to this one woman, and it was hurting her. And But she was right. When I, when I called her on it today, I said, you just told everybody, and you told them how you were hurting me. And she said, but, it, but look where you are at today. <laughs> How many, now listen, how many of y'all have ever wanted to take your mom and just go? <laughs> okay, now besides Sheree, forgive me, Jesus. It might be a social thing. But no, because I, okay, that's me being real because if my mom's right, I'm just like, that. Now that's because of your mom's right and you're like, hmm, why is your, now why, why you gotta be right? Just go, <laughs> uh, go away now. You know what I'm saying? But so, like, um, you know, I've recently gone through a uh, status change where I, you know, God's really showing me, like, what my worth is in some things. And, but, um, God, why do you have to bring my life up? Because then I want to get emotional. And, well, the stuff, like, I feel like, um, you know, there's so much about my life that God, people don't know and they don't see. And I have fought hard to, like, stand. You guys are all here. I stand behind my podium because I don't want people to, like, number one, I don't like to expose my vulnerabilities. But then people do end up seeing my resting face and that's what they see about me and but that keeps me hard and tough and 
then I, I, I only have to stand in front of five people and be emotional and I can ignore the fact that this video will be up on YouTube. <laughs> the entire world can watch me. <laughs> the entire world will, will watch me stand from behind my podium and, and, and say, you know, she's right. I endured a lot. And, and I have stood and I have sucked at it. And I have been terrible to people through it. And, you know, I didn't start enduring when I had surgery. <laughs> you know, I started enduring before I was born. And people in my mom's life didn't want me born and wanted me aborted. So, like, that's where my story begins. And so the enemy tried to take me out before I was born. And then growing up and living through abuse and molestation and then getting older and gaining weight and allowing men to use me and then being raped and beaten and, and everything else. And then getting to the point where I had just, my body was so terrible and, you know, just allowing myself to not find myself worthy anymore because the enemy had lied to me and lied to me and lied to me to the point where I was so angry. You're right. It's, it, you know, and it's okay because I can tell myself I get focused. So that's why I throw myself everything about me into everything I do. You know, you were saying that I, every, like I get very passionate about everything I do. You told me that last week. Every, every relationship I have, like friends and stuff, like I get very passionate and that's the pastoral side of me. I get very like, I love people, but 90% of the people I know would never know it because there's a huge part of me, like even, even like right now. And uh, I've only told like three people this, so people don't even know that this is going on. You know, on Sunday, I'm over here just quietly having this like complete and utter mental breakdown and I'm sure that like you and Angie may have thought it had something to do with the other stuff and people may think it has something to do with him and but it it has everything to do with Sunday <laughs> and the fact that it's another door for the enemy to remind me of what he was what he thinks he was able to steal and for him to remind me of an emptiness inside of me and for, he, you know, and Lord God, I just pray right now that you just give me freedom from this by me being able to say it out loud and be public about it because literally I've only said it to Karen and my mom and my sister, you know, because You know, because the desires inside of me and the promises that God has given me is hard. It's, it's hard as women. I'm just going to remove my entire life out of it, okay? It's hard as women to have gone through a lot because it's not just me. I'm, I, I have my own story, but Cherie's got a story. And you have a story, and you have a story, and you have a story, and you have a story. We all have a story. And we've all endured heartache. And we've all endured heartbreak, and we've all walked on broken pathways, and and had had you know fog ahead of us and scariness, and we've all had promises given to us by God, and and not been able to see, just heard a voice and heard Him tell us things, but not been able to see where where that's at in front of us, and then what happens is the enemy comes along. And he's like, mm -mm, that will never happen. Because this right here, this is the fact. You know, here's the cross, but you can't see the cross right now. Because the facts, the truth of the current situation are standing here. So standing right here is my body in the current physical state that it's in. So my eyes see that my current situation, my body in the current state that it's in, and it can't see the cross, and it can't see my body placed on the cross in its fully healed form, 
and functioning and manifestation of the Holy Spirit in my body where every cell in my body has been rejuvenated. Every cell in my body has been reborn and rebirthed. You know, Bonnie, you may not know, but I had a complete hysterectomy. Um, I, I think you knew, right? So I had a complete hysterectomy. I can't have kids. So that's where my body is now. But I've been promised natural born children. So that's hard, you know, to, to know that and confirm like 15 different times <laughs> and told over and over. But then my body doesn't function like Sharice does. My body doesn't do that right now. And my body, I can't see it on the cross because there's fog and there's God saying, do you trust me? Can you ignore the enemy enough to trust me and to continue to walk down this path? Because at the end of the day, there are 15 million women somewhere in this world. That's the number I just heard. I don't even know if that's an accurate number. So that's the number I just heard. There's 15 million women in this world who cannot have kids, who have been told they will never see children, they will never know what it's like, to see positive on a pregnancy test. He'll never know what it's like to feel it inside of them. I'm not even talking about having a miscarriage because, honest to God, this week I felt like for the past couple weeks that I would even endure that because that would be better than having never known what it was like to feel nothing. So there's 15 million women who would never know any of that but God wants to use me to send me forth to begin to pray one at a time, one at a time, a thousand at a time, and give 15 million women the opportunity. And not, Lord knows, she's telling everybody, she's telling the world, hey, YouTube, I am an absolute B 90% of the time. I really am because I have been angry. I've been angry at the world. I've been angry at God. Because, just like you said, how do you walk up to a woman who's had God in their life and has faced tragedy? But the reality is, is that the woman, me, has to know. And, there's, and until they have a realization inside of them, they, there's not anything that the women around them can do other than stand in love and say, like Cherie did, have a realization and and, and I, God's had to do it to me with women, you know, in 17, 18 years, I've seen lots of women come in and out of my life. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's heartbreaking. Sometimes I get judgmental. And I'm like, well, they didn't deserve any better. And then I have to do a fast check because that's the danger zone there. But the the reality is that I've been angry. I've been in hard places. I know what it is to stand. And, you know, I'll keep saying it. My story may sound tougher and harder than yours, but it's not. It's just different. Because I've endured all this, but you've been strong enough to go the other way and stand and endure having three beautiful babies and be strong enough. I, you know what? I have so much respect and honor for you because I don't know how you do it. Because you, you wake up in the middle of the afternoon when your kids get home from school. You get up and you take them to my house or your cousin's house. And then you go off to work overnight to take care of other people. And you come home and you take care of your kids. You stay up overnight. You get like three or four hours of sleep a day if you're lucky. But you do it because you're strong enough to stand. And I've been on the phone with you in moments where you're not strong enough. And that's just the moments where you let me in. I know there are moments when other people hear so much more. And... And so my story is by far not even a hard one. I've, I've only had to lay on surgery hospital beds and take some 
offer give me some medication and and stand in the support of people who have managed to not kill me. <laughs> Thank everybody for never killing me. I appreciate everyone who's never done that. <laughs> but you know, like I I just like I honor and respect every woman in the world because my story, you're right. If people sincerely understood where I came from every second and every minute of the day, everything might be different. But on the flip side, if I sincerely respected and understood where every other woman in the world came from, then I might start acting a little bit different too. So that's the reality. So that's, you know what, let's bring that all the way back to evangelism, which is what we were talking about. <laughs> but so that's, that's the reality. Going out and evangelizing, which is honestly nothing more than being loved to people, um, is going out and being and understanding where people are and having enough discernment to walk up to Cherie and be, okay, so you're having a hard day and you don't want to hear me tell you that Jesus died on this cross right here for you because quite frankly you got three kids to feed and you're late for work and uh, you just want to stay awake tonight <laughs> um, and you got that co-worker who's just all that talking and yeah so hey you know what I just want to pray that God gives you enough energy tonight and that he keeps you smiling and just know that I love you and to walk away because that's all it takes sometimes is just to be discerning because she doesn't always need to know that you know what you shouldn't have done that you shouldn't have done that I mean, and sometimes they, 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 you do have to draw a hard line but you'll never be able to do it if you don't have their respect and you haven't earned that place in their life unless God does speak so loudly and clearly in your head and says to them says to you to tell them if you go do that tonight you might die maybe you need to rethink what you're doing like, you know, things like that. But in any case, now that I've cried for y'all. Can everybody stretch their hand towards Anna? I just want to agree with the word that you spoke. I want to come into agreement with that and say that you will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. This is now something that's behind you. And behold, God has already created all things new. So God, I just thank you for this great thing that you're doing in Anna's life. I thank you for the boldness that she's stepping out into God and for more of you that's just filling up every empty space, God. And even the revelation of things that were unseen in her own life, how you're surfacing them, God, so that you can shine brighter than anything that's ever tried to hinder her or hold her down. So, God, I thank you for the grace that you've placed on her, and I thank you for all of the lives that will be impacted by her testimony. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. So, it's so important, a lot of what Anna was said, I know we're talking about evangelism, but it's so important because I was going to ask you guys the question, but never got to it. But the question I was going to ask is, <clears throat> so you're walking down the street and you see a woman who, oh, my goodness, I'm going to give you this testimony because it actually happened. So I don't even know if it's a testimony. But, like, I was in my car. But for you, say you're on the street and it's only one sidewalk, I mean, you know, next to the, sh the road. And if somebody's walking, like, you have to kind of go around that person. So I'm driving down the street on Richie Highway. Was it Richie Highway? Or the, the backside one. I, I don't know. Maybe Crane Highway. One of them. But I'm in this, I'm looking, like, what is happening? But it was, like, a man, and he had on fishnet stockings, and he had on... um like a leotard and some shorts, I mean, a leotard, no shorts, and the leotard and 
the fishnet stockings and like a wig and a hat. So I saw him from the back and I was just looking like, who who is this person? You know, like where are they coming from? Like what's going on? Because it's daytime. So normally, like I guess if that, that, that looked like club attire or something like that or anything, could I was looking to see if like maybe they were distressed in their face or whatever. But when I looked, I thought it was a man and like he maybe was intentional about like trying to get that kind of int- attention. So like I just kept driving. But say you were walking towards him and say he just was like ma'am can you just talk to me you know I mean like in a situation like that where you see this man dressed up as a woman you know as a promiscuous woman at that too um how would you handle it I mean and I'm saying that just piggyback because I was going to say it but when Anna started sharing it, it was so good because it's so easy for us to judge people especially in church because people aren't exactly what we perceive to be right or people aren't where we think they should be or people shouldn't be in this position if they're doing that but you know like if God has appointed them and he's doing a a work in their life he's going to bring his glory through it because it's who he is you know and Anna sharing that was just so awesome and so amazing and it's just powerful in itself like her testimony speaks volume volumes but like I'm saying like when she when I first came, I'm just like, why is she so angry? Immediately judging her. You know, that was immediate. Not just like, man, how can I, you know, like, Lord, please give me an opportunity to show her your love. You know what I mean? Or like, what can I do to make her smile? You know, having like a heart of wanting to, even if I notice that she's not in a place where she feel, is shown like a lot of love and compassion, like, How can I be the one to make it different? You know, like just having a heart like that. But, you know, I've grown and me and Anna are so close now. I love her so much. And I thank God for that relationship. But how would you handle that situation? Well, I never meet a stranger for one thing. Um, You know, I, I would act as though they were just like you and would talk. Uh, let them talk because if they stopped you and and said whatever that means they've got something that they need heard and um, to me it doesn't matter because what you've got on or what you're doing and because like I said I never meet a stranger for one thing and um, and but I would let them know that no matter what they did, how they're dressed, or where they're going, will never, you know, I read it this morning in devotional, there's no height, no depth, no, you know, all of this that can separate you from God's love, no fishnet stockings and no wig. So, but we have in over there in front of the house, there's um, a man that is a very pretty woman i can tell that it's a man and and she's young you know in her 20s whatever and um we speak to her every time she passes it does not matter who you are and especially at night if you're a little thuggish i really do speak to you because i want for you to realize that i am somebody you know, and so I speak to everybody and am kind and to everybody that walks past us, and it doesn't matter. But to me, you just, you, you open your heart and, and, and drop what you're doing because that could be Jesus standing there in front of you, and you would never want to turn anybody away, you know. You want to you wanna answer, Miss Glenda? I don't know how I would go about, you know, somebody that I met on the street like that, but I I know one instance that happened to me. I worked in a call center um, where people called in to order women's clothing and such, and a gentleman called in and said he lost a bet, so he had to order a... um, 
negligee set. And I helped him figure out his size by how tall he was and all that kind of stuff. And um, then he said, would you wear, I and it was black. He wanted a black set. He said, would you wear off-white or black stockings with it? And I said, well, it should be black stockings because it's not an off-black. So <coughs> I was trying to be very positive on the phone with him. But then he said to me, okay, honey, what kind of underwear should I wear? And I said, could you hold, please? And I asked my boss, I said, how do I get rid of this guy on the phone? I just, I mean, you know, it, it turned from me trying to help him over a joke to um, this guy isn't really serious, and I don't know how to get rid of him on the phone nicely. Because when you're at a call center, if they listen to you, you know, they, they want to make sure that you're being positive. And it was very hard for me to get through that call. <laughs> so after I had him on hold, I got him back on and, and told him what size pants to get. And then I said, um, do you have everything you need now? Thank you very much. And got off the phone. If they walked up to me, then I would speak to them and try to be in a positive manner and not not um, show anything. <laughs> so I wanted to say that I was incredibly proud of our ministry on Sunday. Um, and there was a couple that came in, and they were different. And in the way that our ministry responded was beautiful because you would not have known that they were different because the love that they were shown was simply the love that we show everybody. And I wanted to read Matthew 25, uh, 31, starting at 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats, I don't know what this means. But <laughs> Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared from you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, my brethren, you did it to me. So, you know, the theme song for our ministry is the the least of these song by the um, Billmans. And so it's just, um, you know, that just kind of is who we are to to take the people that we don't understand or maybe that we don't agree with or that are very different from us and just treat them like it's my Cherie and, you know, to just – embrace them as family and we we are a family oriented ministry and that's one of the beautiful things about us is that everybody that we meet becomes family and so that's all that's good did you want to share anything lady once um two things well in regard to the um the gentleman, if he came up to me, I would ask him what he wanted to talk about. And then I would go slowly and just let the um, Holy Spirit lead me. Um, and 
I was in a store a little while ago, and there was someone, it was a gentleman, he had on makeup and he was dressed kind of mixed, and I, when I get in situations like that, I just, I just want to give love, and I just want to lift up, so I noticed what he was wearing, so I just stopped him, and I gave him a compliment, and, um, about what he was wearing, and afterwards, I was like, oh, that, you know, he was just really open and polite, because he could have just walked away, because he stood and listened to what he had, what I had to say, but I just, in situations like that, in my heart, I just, I just want to just hope in some way, just, just to lift them up, just, just to, just to give them warmth, just, just to give them something positive, because I can just barely imagine the challenges that they must face in being different, and being how, and, and challenges they must face in interacting with people every day. Do you know what I mean? So just, just, to just, um, just to give them love, and. I don't know if this has anything to do with that, but I just, this is coming back to mind. There's a store that I go to, and I went there, and I saw one of the um, cashiers a second time, and when I saw her, she said, she, what did she say? She said, um, she said, oh, I remember you. Yeah, you said, um, God bless you. And I said, oh, really? She said, yeah, there's sometimes there's customers that just really stand out. And she said, when you said that, I, I remember that. I was like, Oh wow! I said that's so sweet. So I just—it's just so important to me to just. I always feel when I leave my house, that's in addition to whatever other assignments Daddy gives me. I always feel that that's my assignment to just uplift. Amen. I agree. We should all be the brightness in somebody's day. Every every last one of us as believers, as the body, you know, to the world, we are the light, the salt, you know, so we should be the ones that people don't forget, the ones of influence, the ones that draw, and I love what you said, because it's so important, you know, I believe (coughs) a lot of times what people lack from family or from relationship with God, they try to find in the world. And, you know, the rebellion, it gives them that um, momentary fix so they feel okay or justified in their actions because of what may or may not have happened any other kind of way. So, for example, if their father wasn't there or they never received love from a man, so now, you know, they need to be with men to try to fill that void. But sometimes people don't realize it you know and even being with men being hurt and experiencing the same thing that you would experience with women um still trying to fill a void that only God can fill but just not having the understanding or the reality of that so that's why it's so important that we are love because regardless of the sin all sin is sin and we all sin and fall short of the glory of God so it's definitely important that we stay in the mindset of just being love, you know? And I think that that was awesome. I love what she said, like giving him a compliment. Like if I was to, if that if that guy that I told you about with the fishnet stockings on walked up to me, you know, like I would be like, your hair looking good or something like that, you know? Like, and it would immediately bring down walls because now I'm relating you know, and now we can have conversation where they don't feel like I'm being fake or phony or trying to read them or judge them, and they can just completely be themselves because I'm I'm like, yeah, you know, your hair looking good. What's up with you? Where you coming from? You know, like, I mean, just being myself and being love, not judging because of what it looks like on the outside, but knowing who God sees when he looks at him, you know. <coughs> So that's definitely a great way to handle a situation like that, Radiance, what you just say. 
you look good. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, and it don't, don't lie. <laughs> don't lie. You know, but like, just, you know, find something, you know, like, like, and, you know, and when you're intentional, when you're seeking God for something concerning his child, like, God, listen, I don't see anything, but this is your child and you created him. So I know that he's great. So what do you want me to say? And sometimes he'll just give you what to say. And sometimes it's just that thing that'll open that door. And when you are like (coughs) personal with people like that, like that, you're just meeting, it's something about you that makes them want they want more they want to talk to you more and even if you feel like they're drawn to you they're drawn to the holy spirit on the inside of you and you are the link that's going to get them to the father just like jesus is the link that gets us to the father and what are we doing we're representing representing jesus in the earth on today you know with holy spirit on the inside of us so awesome so did anybody want to share anything else Yeah, you guys brung it. You guys brung it. So I just want to thank you all for coming, for sharing, being open and vulnerable. You know, I always like to thank you guys for being open and vulnerable because it's not always easy. You know, but I'm telling you, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word, the spoken word of our testimony. So I just want to pray a prayer. And um, the whole point of me talking about evangelism tonight so that we can prepare to evangelize. You know, I mean, it doesn't have to be a set time. It, it would be really nice if we could corporately do it together. You know, as a team, as a unit, you know, and go out and invite other people to our team, you know. Um, but each day in our individual walks, you know, even as you leave tonight, you might just so happen to walk past somebody who needs a word of encouragement who needs a ray of light, and God sent you to be that light in that moment, you know. So don't um, miss those opportunities to shine, to be the light in the midst of darkness, okay? So I'm just going to pray, and we're going to be dismissed for tonight. And I thank you guys for coming out. And um, this was an awesome, awesome time in the Lord. So, God, I just thank you so much for just the great things that you have done on tonight. I thank you for just how you're just moving in such a mighty way in all of us. And I thank you, God, that you meet us right here, right where we are. So, God, I just say continue to have your way in our lives. And I thank you, God, for giving us strategic strategies on how to encounter your children, God, in ways that they will desire you. Because that's our desire, for your children to desire you. So we thank you, God, that you've chosen us and you've called us forth and you've sent us out. And we agree with the commission. We say yes to the things of heaven and we partner with Holy Spirit. And we say send us forth. And uh, may every word that comes forth from our mouths be just all arrows pointing back at you. And we just thank you for all of the opportunities that you're sending our way and for all of your children who are coming into the kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. I just pray for traveling mercies for you guys as you travel. The blood of Jesus all around.